Well, if you have your Bibles today, would you join me, please, in the Gospel according to Luke. I want to say this. I I haven't said it, but I don't mean to look over it. On Wednesday night, we're continuing a study here in uh, the Word of God from the book of uh, on, on, on Elisha. And I'd like to encourage you to be here for that. And while we have the auditorium class, the minors over here. Would you raise your hand? Right here. These folks have a class upstairs for the young people. And uh, now, maybe I need to define young people. Uh, what's the age group you are? <laughs> Four? Four through 11. So if you're in that age bracket... Uh, or your children in that age bracket, right up steps on Wednesday night. They do a great job. They teach them. They train them. They do things with their hands. And uh, your children would thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy that. And remember that's part of our Wednesday evening service. Oh, well, glad to see Todd and uh, Tripp's mom here. God bless you. I just now noticed that she's here. Thank you for being here. And others who are visiting, We're glad to see you today. And again, happy Mother's Day. And again, don't forget, you go out the main door, you'll get a little gift after the service is over today. And if you are a mother, we have a gift for you. If you're not a mother, we still have a gift for you. Feel free to pick it up as you go out the door today. Now, when I said not a mother, I'm talking about females. In this society today, you have to tell it all. Yes, sir. Wow. (laughs) Luke chapter number two. If you have your Bibles, I begin reading in verse number 36. Luke 2, 36. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Peniel, of the tribe of Aser. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in the instant, that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. On this Mother's Day, I want to speak to you from this dear lady we read about here in the Gospel of Luke, Anna. There is so much about her, and uh, I would not be able to touch all of that this morning. But I did want to talk to our mothers today, this being Mother's Day and your special day. But let me say, it being Mother's Day, that don't mean that the men go to sleep. Once in a while, I might say something that the men ought to say amen to. And if you're asleep, you miss it. So make sure, make sure you're with me. And remember, there's going to be a day when I preach to the men. And the ladies might want to say amen. So just keep that in mind as we go down through here. This is not a scorching message. But it is a message from the Bible that we need. So uh, after we pray, let's look at these passages of Scripture. Lord, I thank you today for loving us. I thank you for this special day that's been set aside. And I ask you now to minister to us through your word. May he, the Holy Spirit of God, speak to us uh, in, a, in a powerful way. If there should be in any of our lives today shortcomings, may this be the day when we will confess it as sin. We will renounce it And uh, we will determine that we're going to follow you in fellowship 
and do and be everything you've called us to do and to be. So bless us in these few moments together, and we'll thank you, because we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. There are vital lessons today to be learned from these passages of Scripture, both from women in the church who have children and women who are either not married or don't have children. And there are also lessons here to be learned today from those of us who are men in the building and those who are listening beyond these walls. I was reading a story recently about a young couple had just been married a short period of time and they decided they would buy new appliances for their home, their kitchen. They decided in the meantime to give their refrigerator to their parents. And since the parents was a great distance away, they decided to ship the refrigerator to their parents. A few days later, after they had shipped the refrigerator, the mother called the children and said, uh, I want to pay you for the refrigerator. It's only right that I pay you. And they said, no, mother, it's a gift. We want to give you that, that refriger refrigerator. Uh, well, the mother said, but I want to pay you for it. You need the money. And the daughter said, just consider the refrigerator a repayment for all of those days that you took care of me when I was at home. And they said there was a long pause on the other end of the phone. And the mother said, in that case, the refrigerator doesn't cover the cost. The pain of childbirth, the, the, the pain of childbirth is twofold. First of all, there's the pain of bringing a child into this world. And secondly, there's the pain of bringing the child up in the world. Some parents have stated that bringing the child up is worse than bringing the child in to the world. But we learn some great truths here in these passages of Scripture, in these few verses of Scripture uh, concerning Anna. There's a small voice that carries with it a big bite. And we'll say that again because I'm going to give you an illustration. There's a small voice here that carries with it a big bite. A thief had broke into a home. And while he's in the home, he heard a quiet voice from a dark room. The voice said, Jesus is watching you. The thief shined his light towards the voice. The thief was greatly relieved to see that the voice was coming from a parrot. And the thief said to the parrot, is your name Jesus? And the parrot said, no, my name is Moses. The thief said, who would be dumb enough to name a parent Moses? The parrot said, the same person who was dumb enough to name the pit bull Jesus. <laughs> That was a small voice with a big bite. These passages of Scripture have a big bite to them. And I want you to note with me as we begin to analyze and scrutinize these passages, we find first of all that Anna had known the joy and the sorrow of married life. I want to say it again. Anna had known the joy and the sorrow of married life. Now, in our text verse, we note today that she had lived 
with her husband for seven years. Now think about it. For seven years, she had enjoyed the wonderful relationship of having a husband. There's no doubt as we look at the life of Anna, as we look at her dedication to the Lord, there's no doubt that they had, for those few years, a wonderful relationship. We're not told. We assume, because of what we're finding in these few verses of Scripture, that they had a wonderful marriage. Now, that's not to say they didn't have times of differences of opinion. Someone asked a preacher friend of mine years ago, said, uh, does your words ever get crossed with your wife's words? He said, no, my words can never find a place to get crossed. <laughs> I was in a camp meeting several years ago, and in the camp meeting, Dr. Ralph Sexton, who's now in heaven, was preaching. Billy Kelly, who probably weighed 350, 400 pounds, was leading the singing. Billy Kelly got up and he was singing and, and uh, he said, you know, I was talking to Dr. Sexton a few minutes ago. He'll be speaking to us shortly. And, uh, and he said, uh, I was talking to him about his marriage and he was telling him about all the years that he'd been married at that time, 29 years. But he said, before I talked to him, he said, I, wa I wanted to see what his wife had to say about those years of marriage. And Said, uh, I said to Mrs. Sexton, well, Mrs. Sexton, I guess uh, down through these 29 years, you've probably had some disagreements. Mrs. Sexton said, no. Said, we've been married for 29 years. And said, I have never seen my husband mad one time in 29 years. The 350 pound, Billy Kelly then said, Bless God. It's good she hadn't been married to me because she'd seen three or four doors kicked off of the hinges <laughs> in 29 years. Now, the truth is, a man said one time, do you and your wife uh, ever fuss? No, we just have some disagreements that the neighbors overhear. I don't know of a marriage anywhere, I've never met a person anywhere that could say we've never had a disagreement. I think if somebody said that, my next message to them would be, let's go to the altar and let's pray about this just a minute because it's a sin to lie. <laughs> about everybody, sooner or later, have their disagreements. Now, Usually it takes the wife a little longer to get the husband to come around to her belief system. But <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, there are some disagreements. But the wonderful thing about it is, I believe the Bible is clear. That when there are some disagreements and things that you don't agree on, I believe Christians can sit down, if they're Christian... I believe Christians can sit down and they can find an exit mode. They can find a way through it. Uh, the only reason they could not do that is if God is not sitting on his throne. The last time I checked in the Bible, God is sitting on his throne and we do not have a problem that is as great as his grace and ability to help us work through those problems. Now, I'm thankful that God instituted marriage. I'm glad that God instituted marriage between male and female. God have mercy on a generation that doesn't know the difference and they're trying to change gender identity in this world. Uh, in order to do that, you've got to say that God made a mistake when he created you. God made no mistakes. God put you here, he put us here as male and female. And then he performed the first marriage marriage back in the garden when he brought them together, man and wife, husband and wife, there in the garden of Eden. Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 placed his approval on that relationship when he said, for this call shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they twain shall become one flesh. Thank God for good partners. Thank God for good marriage relationships. 
Thank God for the grace of God that brings us together. Thank God for the good mercy of God that is able to help us sometime to tolerate each other. And usually, 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 God tempers a marriage where one can be a completer to the other. In, in reality, that is the reason why God made woman. He looked at man, and women don't say amen, but he looked at man and said, he's not complete yet. God looked around at all of the animals, and he said, I don't think there's a skunk in the Garden of Eden that he could fellowship with. God looked around at all the animals and said, I don't believe there's a fox or a turtle dove or a pigeon that he'll be happy with. And he caused a deep sleep to fall on him. And the Bible said that out of his side, he took a rib. Now I know, ladies, I know what you're thinking. Prime rib. He took a prime rib. <laughs> he took the rib and the Bible said that he made a woman and the word is built. He built the woman, he created the woman to be his completer. Man was incomplete without the woman. Now you men today that are married, you better shake your head in the affirmative. <laughs> or you may not get any lunch when I get through preaching. In fact, it might be advantageous for you if I just keep on preaching so you can sit here for a while. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, woman is man's Completer. A man that gets the right kind of a woman is a much better man than if he didn't have her. I'm just trying to think if I need to say the other side of that, this is Mother's Day. But a man that gets a woman that's not good for him, the Bible said in the book of Proverbs, it's better to get in the corner of a room somewhere. Get away. Now, uh, <coughs> You can say amen, I'm stopping right there. But, <laughs> but marriage is a wonderful thing. I'm glad God ordained it. I'm glad that there is someone that can be by our sides to encourage us in downtime. There's someone that can help carry the burdens. There's someone that you can join together in prayer and pray over the needs that come into that marriage relationship. Pray over the children specific needs of the church, etc. It's wonderful when a man and woman can sit down together and discuss the problems together and pray together and fellowship together and go to church together and be together and look forward to being together. An individual who'd rather stay on the creek bank than to stay spend time with his wife should have never gotten married. And there's nothing wrong with going fishing. But my friend, God never created a man to get married to live on the creek bank or to spend all of his time with the boys. God created man and woman to be together. He created them to be together. That's the way it ought to be. Marriage ought to be a togetherness. And Anna enjoyed seven years of marriage. Seven short years. You know, people in the building today, and we have several people who've lost their mate, including myself. And people in the building today who's lost their mate, if they'd be honest about it, and I think they would be, would give anything if it were possible to have another five minutes with them. Uh, to have another day together. To have another year together. But those times have now elapsed permanently. And I said that to say this, if you're here today and you're sitting beside of your wife or your wife is here or you have a wife, be appreciative because the day will come when one of you will make an exit. The day will come when one of you will be in eternity and then you may stop and think and consider and you may things may go across your mind like, you know, if I had it to do over, I would have handled this situation a little differently. You know, if I had it to do over, I would have told her more often that I loved her. If I had it to do over, I would have stayed at home a little more. We would have spent more time together. Uh, listen, while you have your wife or you have your mother, take time to tell them you love them. Take time 
and spend time with them. There will come a day sooner or later when your husband or wife will no longer be there. Take advantage of the opportunity you have right now to show your appreciation. And let me tell you something. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, I hadn't planned on staying this long here, but I, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians to let not the sun go down on your wrath. You know what that means? Don't ever go to bed at night mad at each other. You know why? The, the Bible says that the little foxes destroy the vine. You get something small. It's just like a splinter. You get a splinter in your hand. If you don't deal with it, the next thing you know, it's got pus there. The next thing, it's swelling. The next thing, it's throbbing. The next thing, it's hurting. It's bringing pain to your body. It's a lot better to get on your knees beside of the bed of the night, put your arms around each other and say, God, thank you for the grace of this day. Thank you for the mercy of this day. Thank you for the blessings of this day. And Lord, forgive me for saying things that I shouldn't have said to my husband or forgive me for saying things I shouldn't have said to my wife. Lord, forgive me for not handling this relationship in a Christ-like way. My friend, I want you to understand something. Life is too short to live it being crossed up, being mad. I used to know an individual would go for weeks and wouldn't even speak to his wife. Man like that just needs to get saved, get born again. That's all that needs to happen to him. A good dose of old time salvation, straighten that out. I want you to understand, we don't need to. Now, somebody said years ago, he said, ever before we go to bed at night, he said, if we got a disagreement, we bury the hatchet. And said, tomorrow morning, we dig it up again. <laughs> now, that's not forgiveness. That's not, that's, that's holding grudges. Sometimes a wife won't fix a meal because she's mad at the husband. I'm looking at your countenances. I'm telling who I, I can tell by looking at you. Sometimes a, a, a man won't do for his wife what he ought to because he's pouting. Men are some of the worst people in the world to pout. <laughs> Now, come on. I hadn't, the last 10 minutes of stuff I've said, I hadn't even planned on saying. <laughs> but it needs to be said. Amen. Here was a lady named Anna who was married for seven years. I believe during that period of time that she had a wonderful husband and had a wonderful relationship. That was the wonderful, joyous part of being married. But also... I want you to note, not only was there the joy of being married, but there was the sorrow that came into the life. The Bible says, and I want you to notice this, that she knew the sorrow of her husband passing away. The Bible said in verse 37 that she was a widow of about four score and four years. Now think about that. For 84 years now, she's been a widow. She had a husband for seven years, but she knew the sorrow. She knew the sorrow of losing her husband. I'm, I'm sure that after she lost her husband, she had to battle some things in her life. There was the sorrow. Now, as I said, there are several people in this building today who've lost mates. And only people in this building today who have lost mates will understand what I'm about to say. There is a sorrow that you have to experience. Nothing like any sorrow you've ever experienced in your life. Now somebody might say, you know, I'll be glad when the old haggle's gone. But it's a different story when you approach that portion of your life. I want you to understand that it's difficult when you look at the casket in the cemetery and you turn and walk away and your husband or your wife is encased in the casket. You go back to an empty house. You go back into a house and you see the clothes in the closet. I remember when my first wife was killed in an automobile accident, and I remember going back into the parsonage. I was living in a parsonage at that time. And I'm, I remember just walking in the kitchen late in the afternoon. 
And before my wife had left that morning, she had washed the dishes and put the dishes in a, in a, a, a strainer and, and she had taken the dish towel and laid it over the top of the dishes. There was the dish towel right where she had left it. I remember looking into clothes in the closet and there was the dresses and uh, all of the different clothes on the hangers that she'd put them on and placed the hangers there in the closet. I remember looking at the furniture in the house. The furniture was the way she had organized it and the pictures on the wall was the way that she had organized it. And the same thing with Linda. When Linda, three years ago this month, went to heaven, go back in the house, and you're reminded of everything. Everywhere you look, you're reminded, and it's okay. That's the way it ought to be. But my friend, there's sorrow encased in that because everywhere you look, you're reminded of the wonderful days that are, our, that are now past and days that you will never be able to relive again. Listen, you have those days now. You have those times now. If your husband's with you or your wife's with you, for God's sake, take it seriously. Don't take it lightly because before you realize it, you're going to be following a casket out of the church out to a cemetery somewhere. Don't take your marriage lightly. I want you to understand there comes in the life of the believer that loses their mate. She had lost her husband. She probably experienced loneliness. Some people to experience depression. But with all she had gone through, these passages of Scripture are so encouraging. You know why they're encouraging? Because she never allowed the tragedy in her life to keep her from serving God faithfully at the house of God. All through these verses that I've read today, we see her around the house of God. In the days of this setting, to be a widow was very difficult. As a matter of fact, if you read the book of Acts, they selected seven people full of faith, the Holy Spirit, honest report, full of wisdom for the explicit purpose of looking after the widows and widows in the church. In that day, uh, widows had it, uh, had it, rough if, because of the conditions in which they were having to live. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, as he wrote to Timothy about widows, he said uh, he commanded as quickly as possible, if it was possible for him to do so, for them to remarry so they'd have somebody to look after them. And here's a lady who had sorrow in her heart because she's had to say goodbye. But for 84 years, she kept on serving the Lord. I met so many people down through the years when they lose loved ones, they tend to get bitter. They tend to say, why did God take my husband? They tend to say, why did God take my life? My wife, they tend to say, if God really loved me, he would not have taken him or would not have taken her from me. And as a result, they get bitter at God over that. I would never be dumb enough to question the wisdom of God. God knows what he's doing. I don't understand his workings in my life in that respect. But I'm not dumb enough to question the wisdom of God. God sees the whole picture. I only see part of it. God makes no mistakes. And someday in his presence, all of the questions we have now will find an answer. And he's not obligated to explain everything to us, but we're obligated to take it by faith, to live by faith, to believe that God loves us enough that he'll never lead us where his grace will not sustain us. Here's a lady that enjoyed the wonderful seven years of marriage, but for 84 years now, uh, she's been a widow. I want you to notice in verse number 37, the Bible said she was a widow of about four, four score and four years, which departed not from the temple. She stayed by the house of God, because the house of God was important to her. I preached a funeral right here several years ago. It was a man. And I noticed shortly after I preached the funeral, the man's wife could come in. And I went 
to the individual. And I said, I've been missing you in church. And the individual responded to me this way. He said, well, every time I come back to church, all I can think about is my husband laying there in that casket. I see him. I can't come in that environment. And yet, she drove back to the house they lived in. She's still driving the car they bought together. You know, sometimes people use excuses that are so flimsy they will not stand the test of God's judgment. Here's a lady that lost her husband. But the house of God was still important to her. Do you see that? In my home church years ago, there was a dear Christian lady. I mean, she was from the old school. Now, some of you uh, uptown people and uh, some of you uh, people that, that want it dignified. The most dignified people you'll see in the world is mummies over yonder in Egypt. I don't want to be a mummy. But this dear lady would come to church. She had a lost husband. And she had some lost children. She was faithful to the house of God. And what I was getting ready to say when I got on the subject of mummies is because sometimes the creek would get out of the banks. And I mean by that, the choir would be singing or the preacher would be preaching and the glory would come down. And I've watched this lady. I remember, I can see it as if it happened five minutes ago. She would stand up. She'd hold her hands up in the air like that. And she'd say, woo in her terminology. If I said it like she said it, it'd scare some of you. But she'd get up, she'd shout. She'd come to the altar and she'd pray for her lost husband. I knew her husband, I'd witnessed to him. He was a chronic alcoholic. But every time I'd meet him, his face was flushed from alcohol. You could see it in his eyes. You could see it in his countenance. Uh, sometimes he couldn't even get the car in the driveway. He'd be so drunk, he'd park out in a ditch. She had to live with that. But she never, never quit coming to church. Sometimes he'd threaten her about going to church, but she'd go to church. Sometimes he would make it very difficult for her to go to church, but she kept on going to church. And she kept on going to the altar and she kept on calling his name and she stayed faithful to God. Amen. One day my pastor went by the house and I'll call, I'll call him Jack. That was not his name, but he went by and he sat down to talk to Jack. Guess what? Her prayers for her lost husband and her faithfulness to the house of God had won Jack over. The pastor sat down and the pastor said, Jack, don't you think it's time you get saved? We've witnessed to you down through the years. Don't you understand you're drawing closer and closer to eternity and you need to get right with God. You don't want to die this way, do you? And he said, no, sir. Preacher said, Jack, don't you think it's time to get this thing settled? Your wife's coming to the altar praying for you. Your wife's witnessing to you. Your wife's living in front of you the way she should live. She's faithful to the house of God. She set the right example. She's not hypocritical. She set the right example in front of you. Don't you think you ought to go to the house of God with her and get saved? Jack said to the preacher, yes, sir. I believe I should. And the preacher told me about it later. He said, I couldn't hardly believe it. I had to ask him the second time because he was so hard-hearted. And he said, Jack, did I hear you say, you want to get this thing settled? You want to get saved? You want to get your sins under the blood? He said, yes, sir, I do. He said, I've persecuted my family long enough. He said, I've drank enough liquor to float a battleship. He said, it's time for me to go ahead and make that move. And there in the house, they got down in front of a sofa. And Jack got down on his knees and he wept his way through to the throne of grace. And he said, God, I've been such a miserable sinner. God, I've mistreated my family and I've beat my wife. Uh, and I've taken good money and spent it for liquor instead of groceries uh, and utilities. And he said, God, I'm just a big old sinner. And 
saying, Lord, if you'll receive me, if you'll take me, if you'll forgive me, I'll take you right now to be my Savior and the Lord of my life. And he prayed through with tears running down his cheeks there in the living room. And he stood up and said to the preacher, Hallelujah, I feel a load has been lifted because Jesus has forgiven me of all the garbage I've done down through the years in my life. I'm saved. Guess what happened? The next time the church doors open, here comes that dear lady. She's got her arm through his arm. They're coming into church together. She's got a smile on her face from one ear to the other ear. She's as happy as a June bug in a briar patch. She's coming in, both of them, both of them look like they just got married. Both, both of them look like they just walked down the aisle and said, I do. Uh, both of them came in church and sat down. Hey, I can see them right now. Sat down halfway on the right side of the church in a pew uh, and the singing starts singing. And his dear wife uh, normally sings in the choir, but she's sitting there beside him. She's hooked up to him. She's hooked up to him because he was lost and now he's saved and they're going to heaven together. Amen. Every once in a while, she'd hold a little hand up towards glory. Preacher'd get up and she's sitting there with a smile on her face. You know why? Because she's seen the travail of her soul and she's been satisfied because she, came, she stayed faithful to God. She kept on going in good times and in bad times. Sometimes she'd walk in having been abused because of an alcoholic husband, but she went on. She kept on going. She stayed faithful. She set the example and her husband got saved. He didn't live about three or four years after that. He had cancer and didn't know it. Uh, but the last three or four years of their marriage was the happiest years of their marriage. Uh, they came to church together. They sat together. They never missed a service. Uh, and they both sat there with a smile of heaven on their countenance. Uh, what made the difference? She had prayed in his presence. She had been faithful to go on and serve God under difficult circumstances. Uh, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit had taken place in her life. And, she, and he came to that point in his life where he said, it's enough. I've got to get saved and he got saved and the entire family was challenged and changed because of a godly mother who said I'm going to serve God in spite of everything that's happening in spite of the persecution I'm going to keep on serving God here's a dear lady who for 84 years can you imagine that for 84 years she kept on <laughs> she kept on serving God Oh, she loved the Lord's house. Oh, my friend, listen, we ought to be attached to the Lord's house. You know, the Lord's house, the Lord's house is not just another gathering place. We got to understand there's places in the community where people come and congregate and in some instances aggravate. But when we come to the house of God, this is not another place. Listen, folk, this is not another place in the community. This is a place in the community that's been set aside here by divine decree because the church is not just another place. The church has been purchased by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and that makes church different. Let me ask you something. It's 11.05. Not right now. I'm, I'm giving an illustration. I'm not going to tell you what time it is. It's a... Uh, it's 11.05. It's 11.05. We've, we've had our singing. Brother Clayton's got up. He's led the congregation. Preacher's not here. So uh, Brother Clayton comes up here and he says, I, I think the preacher will probably be here in a few minutes. Don't know where he's at. He reads the announcements, prayer request. The choir sings. Choir comes down. Ushers come up, no preacher. And by now, people are calling my phone. Amen. Amen. By now, everybody's whispering in their ears. Anybody heard from a preacher? <laughs> Has anybody seen the preacher? It's not like him. He's usually here on time. We've had the choir singing. We had the congregational singing. It's time to take up the offering. No preacher. 
What's happened to the preacher? Where's the preacher at? Are you getting my vibes? Do you know where I'm going with this? Well, let me help you with it so you won't make a mistake on it. I have the same right when you don't show up to wonder what the problem is. Now the amens are not as loud as they were a while ago. You say, preacher, but. You think that but will work when you stand in the presence of the Lord? Do you think you can violate scriptural interpretation and expect the blessings of God on your life? I didn't say it. You know, everybody gets mad at the preacher. I'm just the mailman. I'm delivering the mail. Hebrews 10 says to the church not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That word assembly means churching. Not to forsake the churching of yourself together. Here's a lady that had all kinds of problems in her life. And you know what she did? She stayed around the Word of God. You know how she made it through the difficulty? She stayed around the Word of God. You know what encouraged her to keep on going on? The saints down at the house of God. You know why she didn't give up? There was a God who promised to meet at the house of God and she decided the best place in the world I can be is where God should. Up. You know what happens when you go to the house of God? Well, if you don't, let me tell you. Let me tell you. When you go down to the house of the Lord, your joy will be a lot greater. I want to say it again. Your joy, well, listen to what the Bible says. Your joy will be a lot greater. Uh, the Bible said, and they continued daily, one accord in temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the, uh, the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Your joy be increased. If you stood in the pulpit and looked at what I have to look at sometimes... <laughs> chin so long you could drop it out of a three story window and use it for a fire escape. Uh, some people look like they've been drinking two gallons of dill pickle juice before they get here. And you know some of those same people when the service is over they're going up to somebody and they're hugging them and grabbing them by the hand and say well hallelujah it's good to be saved. What changed the course of action? Being in the house of God, worshiping with God's people, hearing the singing of the songs of Zion, hearing the preaching of the word of God, it'll stimulate you. It'll bring joy to you. It'll encourage you. And you can come in looking like a question mark and you can go out looking like an exclamation mark when God meets with you. That's the reason some of you are so miserable you don't hang around the church long enough. You say, well, I hung around the church and I got miserable. That's your fault. Get on the altar and you can understand what I'm talking about. If you come to church to be a fault finder, you'll find fault. If you come to church to worship, you can worship. No more offering going to be taken. Go ahead and enjoy it. Amen. We need church like Anna needed church. Her joy was greater. Let me tell you something else. Your influence will be greater. Your influence will be greater. Let me ask you a question. Wherever you live, in whatever community you came from today, if there's a tragedy in your community, and you've got in your community someone you know who loves the house of God, they're faithful to church, they go to church, uh, they don't use church as an excuse. They really love the Lord versus all the people in the community that don't go to church, want nothing to do with the church. They cuss the church. They, uh, they want nothing to do with it. But there's somebody every Sunday morning, their car's pulling out of the driveway. You know they're going to church. Every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, revival time, their car is not found in the driveway because they love the house of God. They need the house of God. They enjoy the house of God. They go to the house of God. And a tragedy strikes in your community 
and you need somebody to come, you need somebody to pray for you. Are you going to go in the community to the person that's faithful to church and ask them to pray? Or are you going to go to the person that never goes to church? You know, the person you're going to want to pray for you is the person you believe that loves God enough they're faithful to the house of God and you believe they can get their prayers answered and you want to go to somebody that loves him enough to go to the house that he died for. We've tried to build in the Berean Baptist Church and I'm finished. I finished long. We've tried to build in to the Berean Baptist Church. Let's be friendly. Anybody that comes, let's make sure that we shake their hand. We let them know we're glad they're here. A few Sunday nights ago, I had a man in this pulpit. I'll not call his name. But you know who I'm talking about because this is aired. There was a man in the pulpit, pastor of a large church. In fact, they run about a thousand. He preached here, done a good job. He called me the following week. He said, preacher, after we got back home, he said, me and my wife went to bed and he said, I was about half asleep. He said, usually my wife goes to sleep before I do, but I noticed my wife wasn't asleep. But I heard my wife crying. Heard her sniffling. And he said, I put my hand on my wife and said, honey, what's wrong? And through the tears coming down her cheek, she said to her preacher husband, I can't get over how friendly Berean Baptist Church was to us. Amen. She said, I, I can't believe that there's still a church that'll make people welcome Amen. like Berean Baptist Church did. She said, I can't get over those people acting like they really cared. They was really pleased. They were happy that we was there. Yes. I felt like I was about 10 feet tall when he said that. Amen. Because some people go to church and they go away and they say, you know, nobody even shook my hand. I had it happen to me one time as a preacher. I was, the church was looking for a pastor. I was in between churches. I went and they shook my hand one time. Now, that was before I preached. <laughs> Some churches, they, they go out and they talk about the fight they had. I know of a church right now, uh, they still talk about it after 50 years that the pastor and the chairman of the deacon board stood on the front steps of the church and got in a fist fight. Now that's good advertisement for Jesus. When we can come together and fellowship with each other and love each other and shake hands with each other and meet with God because we have the promise. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name. He said, there I will be in the midst. We have the promise that every time we drive on this property, we're going to have a meeting from heaven. He's promised to meet with us. He's promised to help us. He's promised to love us. He's promised to help us experience his presence and power upon our lives. So as we leave, we can leave this with joy unspeakable and full of glory and we can go out with influence upon our lives uh, and our neighbors can see us pull back up in the driveway and said hey church must be important to them because they've been in church tonight they've been in church this morning church was important to this lady she just you know how important it was to her she just moved in just read it she just spent her time there. They had little booths around the, the, the temple where priests could stay when it was their duty to be there. And most people believe that they had taken one of those little booths and they'd give it to her so she could just stay there and pray. Amen. Just stay there and, and worship God. Just stay there and be a blessing. Amen. Oh, now, don't make me have a heart attack and come up after service and say, Preacher, I love the house of God so much, I think I'll just camp down here this evening, pray all evening long. Please call 911 before you do that. <laughs> but we ought to love the house of God. Yes. Hey, not because the preacher said so. 
but because God said so. God said it. Church ought to be important. It was to her. Let me tell you another reason why church, I'm finished. I told you I finished long. Let me, listen, church ought to be important because of the influence it has on your children. I got an invitation in the church I pastored. Right in the middle of the invitation, a man and his wife walk down the aisle. They're crying uncontrollably. Said, preacher, our son and daughter-in-law and grandson are unchurched. Said, preacher, would you come to our house this week? We need to talk to you. I said, I'll be glad to. They lived in a mobile home. I'll never forget it. I drove up in the driveway, stepped up on the porch, walked in, and they again broke down. Here's what they told me. Said, preacher, all the years our kid was growing up, we set a bad example. We let them know that church didn't really mean what it ought to. We went to church when we wanted to. Said most of the time, we was down to the coast, up at the mountains or somewhere. Church didn't really matter to us. And said, under your preaching, I've got burden for my family because I know my family is not saved. And said, preacher, last week I went to my son and daughter-in-law and grandkid and I invited them to come to church. And said, they laughed at me. They said, well, mom, church wasn't important to you all the years we was growing up. Why should it be important now? And then the son made this statement to his mother. Mother, I'm not even sure there is a God. Mom, I'm at least an agnostic, maybe an atheist. How did he arrive at that conclusion? Because spiritual things didn't mean much to that family. Let me tell you something. In this world in which we're living, you need church. I need church. We need church. Our nation is going to hell in a handbasket. Our nation is deranged mentally and emotionally and politically and spiritually. And the only way you're going to be able to survive and the only way your family is going to be able to survive in these very serious down times in which we're living is to be anchored to the house of God and to fellowship with God's people and to meet with God's people and to hear the preaching and enjoy the singing and, and the fellowship. You need that to get through this world. You're not strong enough to do it by yourself. Church is important. This lady said, I need it. Because after seven years, I've lost my husband. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna camp around in the presence of God. I know I can get through it if I do that. When tragedy comes, listen now and I'm finished. When tragedy comes, some people don't make it. I seen that on display this week. I'll go no farther than that, but I've seen it on display this week. Some people don't make it. But the only way you're going to ever make it through the tragedy you're, you're, you are yet ex are going to experience and face, you're going to have to be tied closely to a power that's greater than any power you have, or you might not survive. I've been through the meal. I don't say this braggadociously. I stand here today because there's a power greater than I am. Amen. Yes, Lord. Which has sustained me. Amen. If you don't have it, you need to get a hold of it. Let's stand with our heads bowed. And our eyes closed. I wonder if you're in this building today. And you say, Pastor, I have some needs in my life. I want to be honest. Whatever the need is, I... I might have hit on it. The Spirit of God might have hit on it. But you say, preacher, I've got some needs in my life. And I need prayer. Please pray for me. I will pray for you. I'll not come to you. I'll not embarrass you. But I'll pray for you. Preacher, pray for me. I've got some needs in my life. Would you raise your hand right now? I see hands all over the building. Thank you. 
I wonder if you'd be here today without Christ and you'd say, if I died today, I'm facing a Christless eternity. Please pray for me. Slip your hand up and let me pray for you. Anywhere in the building. Yes, 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 I see that. Father, I bring all of these needs today before the throne of grace. I pray especially for the hands that went up today that said I'm not saved. Help this to be the good day. Then all of your children today, I'm assuming they're your children, they, they raised their hands. They said, I've got needs. I've got a lot of needs. I've got great needs in my life. Lord, I want to ask you in a very special way, please help them. Please minister to them. Please, in these next few moments, Lord Spirit of God, speak and help folks to deal with the needs in their lives. So when the crisis comes, they'll be prepared. They'll have the wherewithal to get through it. Now, Lord, help us in the closing moments of this invitation. In Jesus' name, we sing this stanza. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you raised your hand and you're not saved, I want to ask you right now, slip out. Come on down here and let us pray with you. We'll be glad to take the Bible. We'll be glad to show you how to be saved. Step out and come right now if you raised your hand and let us pray with you. If you're here and you're a Christian, you raised your hand, you've got needs. Come on right now. We're singing as you come right now.